I have given myself up to nature. I have spent a whole fall observing the changing tints of the foliage. Let me lead you back into your woodlots again. Henry Thoreau. In these genial days of autumn, a bliss is scattered over the earth. I recline upon the grass and whisper, O oh, perfect day, O oh, beautiful world, O oh, beneficent God, Nathaniel Hawthorne. A sunset, a forest, a river view are more to me than friends. I put on my old boots and old hat and slick away to an old cow path where I solace myself for hours. Truly, I am not alone or unacknowledged. The fields nod to me and I to them. Waldo Emerson. This is my letter to the world that never wrote to me. The simple news that nature told with tender majesty. Emily Dickinson. Hello, my name is Jack Hussey. One of the things I've learned in my years of teaching America's literature is that much of it, especially in the 19th century, was produced in just one state, Massachusetts. I'd like to welcome you to this program, which is all about the lives, homes, and hometowns of the most original and enduring of the great 19th century Massachusetts writers. They're the ones whose words you heard a moment ago and, and we'll hear again in this program. Ralph Waldo Emerson, Nathaniel Hawthorne, Henry Thoreau, and Emily Dickinson. One of the chief glories of their poems and tales, their essays and autobiographies, is that they, they describe with such passionate precision the homes and villages the writers lived in, and the orchards and hills they sauntered through, and the streams and ponds they rode and dreamed over. And what amazes their admiring readers is how many of those places still exist for us to see today. Uh, I myself have come to Massachusetts to do so twice. I was here uh, a couple of months ago in August and now again in the splendor of a New England October. My trips have taken me to three of the oldest towns in Massachusetts. Emily Dickinson's Amherst, Nathaniel Hawthorne's Salem, and Emerson's Thoreau's, and again Hawthorne's Concord. It's Concord where we'll begin. Twenty miles west of Boston, Concord is the capital of America's literature as surely as Washington is the capital of the government. Concord was so important because Emerson was here, and his high-minded, heart-stirring essays and poems attracted other writers and philosophers to visit or settle here. Though raised in Boston, Waldo, which was a name he preferred to Ralph, came to love Concord during boyhood vacations in his family's ancestral home, the Old Manse. It was from its upper windows that on April 19, 1775, his grandfather had watched 200 local Minutemen exchange fire with British troops at the North Bridge, thus igniting the Revolutionary War. A hundred years later, Waldo celebrated this famous battle in his poem, Conquered Him. After graduating from Harvard, Waldo, like all the Emerson men, became a Unitarian minister and was given a prominent Boston church to shepherd. Though outwardly a placid fellow, one of his friends said that no one had ever seen him run, the young pastor seethed with doubts about his vocation, and after his beloved wife Ellen's death, they had been married little more than a year, the 31-year-old Emerson abandoned his career and went to Concord to live in the old manse with his step-grandfather, the stern Reverend Ezra Ripley. Upstairs in the study, Emerson began his new life as a writer and composed his first book, Nature, a long prose poem on, well, everything. It urges readers to free themselves from fear, greed, and reverence for the past, and to tap the joyful spiritual energy that flows in them and nature. He wrote in vivid, over-the-top images, which enthralled and sometimes amused his readers. A few months before publishing Nature, Waldo bought this handsome house just east of the town square. He did his writing in the first floor study, Upstairs in the rear of the house is the bedroom which he shared with his second wife, Lydian. They lived here for 50 years. Their children were born here, and the firstborn, Waldo Jr., died here at the age of six, 
a source of endless grief for his parents. As his fame grew, Emerson spent many months of every year behind podiums in lyceums and meeting halls throughout America and Europe. His lectures and published essays like Self-Reliance and the Divinity School Address became rallying cries for a horde of idealists, reformers, bores, cranks, and other transcendentalists who came knocking on Emerson's door, some to become his lifelong friends. One of the most notable was the journalist and feminist Margaret Fuller, who became the first editor of the transcendentalist magazine, The Dial. Another friend was Bronson Alcott. Now, Alcott was not a great writer, but he is interesting and important enough for us to spend a minute on him. Called the most complete idealist in America and the worst provider, Alcott dragged his long-suffering wife and daughters from house to house and town to town following his utopian dreams. An idealist even in the dining room, Bronson mashed potatoes with strawberries in order, as he put it, to make the juices fraternize. He loved long philosophical conversations and would sit in his front yard and offer apples to any passerby hungry enough to join him in a few hours of high-toned chit-chat. His friend and next-door neighbor Hawthorne would sneak to town through the woods if he saw Alcott and his apples down the road. Yet despite his eccentric ways, Alcott, earlier than anyone else in Concord, was a fearless abolitionist and rescuer of fugitive slaves. He was also a pioneer in child psychology and adult education, and he created the nation's first integrated schools. This is the school of philosophy he built in the backyard of the home Emerson had helped him buy, called the Orchard House. In the parlor of the house, the four Alcott girls put on shows for their friends, the Emersons, Hawthorns, and Thoreaus. The second daughter, Louisa, had an ardent crush on Waldo and once said, a kiss from Mr. Emerson would make even matrimony endurable. In 1868, Louisa sat in her room at this desk Bronson had built for her and wrote one of America's most popular novels, Little Women thereby rescuing her family forever from poverty. Returning to Emerson, in the decade before the Civil War, he joined Alcott and Thoreau in writing and speaking against slavery and bravely faced down pro-slavery mobs. Loathing his finicky aloofness from people, Waldo eventually became the kindest and most generous man in Concord and was so beloved that the town helped pay to repair his house after a fire had damaged it. He lived to be nearly 80, his last years marred only by memory loss and grief for his long dead son and friends, Hawthorne and Thoreau. As charming, amiable, and cheerful as always, Waldo Emerson died in his bedroom in April of 1882. Dr. Ripley died this morning he identified himself with the old church of the New England Puritans. Great, grim, earnest men, these Puritans. I belong to other thoughts and schools than yours. By the rude bridge that arched the flood, their flag to April's breeze unfurled, here once the embattled farmers stood and fired the shot heard round the world. Standing on the bare ground, I become a transparent eyeball. I am nothing, I see all. The currents of the universal being circulate through me. I am part or parcel of God. My valiant Henry Thoreau does not postpone his life, but lives already and gives me in flesh and blood my own ethics. He has introduced me to the riches of his stream, a lovely new world lying close and yet unknown to the vulgar streets and shops. Yesterday night, my little Waldo ended his life. Alas, I chiefly grieve that I cannot grieve. Must every experience but kiss my cheek like the wind and pass away. Miracles have ceased? When? 
They had not ceased to this afternoon when I walked into the wood and got into bright, miraculous sunshine. Who gazes upward at the clouds or downward at the moss and says to himself that miracles have ceased? Henry shrinks from me as far as I have shrunk from him. There is war between us. There is hate in him and fear in me. There was a tragic element in Hawthorne, a painful solitude which could no longer be endured, and he died of it. Life is good only when it is magical and musical, and when we do not interrogate it like a college professor. I'm half a mile down the road from Emerson's house, standing in front of uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne's last home. He bought it from Bronson Alcott and called it The Wayside. The great novelist only lived in Concord for about eight years, and the first time he is here in the 1840s, he was utterly unknown, impoverished, and only a few short stories to his credit. But in 1860, now prosperous and renowned, Hawthorne returned to live out his life in Concord because he felt it was a truer home for him than his native Salem, and because the Concord Transcendentalists were some of his closest friends. Now, anyone who knows Hawthorne's darkly skeptical temperament could hardly guess that he'd fit in, or even want to fit in, with these idealists, reformers, radicals. For one thing, in politics, he was a conservative Democrat, and often accused of being soft on slavery, which was untrue, and dovish on the Civil War, which was true. He never felt that preserving the Union was worth the carnage it would cost. His stories radiate uh, melancholy, uh, compassion, uh, oh, a pessimism, which is utterly at odds with the buoyant hopefulness of the Transcendentalists. And Hawthorne could never believe Emerson's notion that, uh, well, to put it simplistically, a life in nature can free us of uh, history and guilt, which are impediments to our latent divinity. Hawthorne also had a, a quick laugh at uh, the absurdities that rash idealism can lead to, particularly because he had seen it in himself during his stay at a utopian commune called Brook Farm, uh, where he spent about eight months shoveling manure. And though he hated commerce and politics as much as someone like Thoreau, Hawthorne nonetheless could dive lucratively into both fields when poverty and family responsibility demanded it. And yet, despite all these differences with his Concord neighbors, no one enjoyed them or loved Concord more than Nathaniel Hawthorne. Hawthorne was born on the 4th of July, 1804, in this room, in this house, in the ancient seaport of Salem. He always felt as if Salem's narrow, winding streets were haunted by his stern Puritan ancestors. One had flogged Quakers for heresy, and another had bound women over for trial as witches. After graduating from college, Hawthorne lived in Salem with his mother and sisters until he was 38 and had achieved his goal of becoming a writer of fiction. He had burned story after story until, like young Goodman Brown, they were good enough to get published. Then he married Sophia Peabody from a famous Boston family, and their marriage saved them both from lives of suffocating solitude. Hawthorne rented the old manse from Emerson's family, and he and Sophia spent their wedding night and the first three blissful years of their marriage here in what they both called Eden itself. They hiked the hills, swam in the local lake called Walden Pond, and befriended the Emersons, Alcotts, and Henry Thoreau, whom they liked best of all. They also couldn't stop writing each other and everyone else. They even etched messages with Sophia's diamond on the windows of the dining room and study. Here he wrote, Nathaniel Hawthorne, this is his study, 1843. He built this fold-down desk facing away from the window in the study, so the orchard and the Concord River out back couldn't entice him from his writing. Finally, though, poverty expelled them from their conquered Eden, and they returned to Salem so Hawthorne could earn a living as the surveyor of the local custom house. 
getting fired from this tedious job, finally freed him to stay on in Salem and write his first and greatest novel, a bestseller then and ever since, The Scarlet Letter. The story, set in Puritan Boston, describes the battles between the noble Hester Prynne, her vengeful husband, and her spineless lover. The novel reveals Hawthorne's lifelong fascination with sin, guilt, and the impact of Puritanism on America. One day, soon after writing The Scarlet Letter, Hawthorne was given a tour of a cousin's venerable house overlooking the Salem Harbor. She led him up from the parlor to the attic and showed him the secret staircase which coiled down the center of the huge chimney. It was this house which inspired Hawthorne's second novel about a family destroyed by an ancient curse, The House of the Seven Gables. He went on to write two more novels and some travel and children's books and to serve as a diplomat in England and Europe before he, Sophia, and their three children were prosperous enough to return to Concord for good in 1860. Then in his late 50s, Hawthorne renovated the wayside, planted this Hawthorne tree, and had a room built on the roof, his sky parlor, as a study. Here, Hawthorne hoped to recapture the bliss and inspiration he had felt 20 years earlier, but tragically, he never could. While standing at yet another desk facing a wall, he started three novels, but finished none of them. A brain tumor slowly drained, afflicted, and finally killed him in May 1864 at the age of 59. He died in his sleep in an inn in New Hampshire while on a walking tour with his oldest friend, the former President of the United States, Franklin Pierce. His body was brought back to Concord for a crowded funeral on a day when an observer said, the village was all sunshine and blossoms and the song of birds. Sophia said that she wished no one would try to write about him, for no one can know enough to do it. I have put me into a dungeon and cannot find the key to let myself out. I have seen so little of the world that I have nothing but thin air to concoct my stories of. The old man stands behind a noble avenue of trees. Our parlor has to be one of the prettiest in the world. In the second story is our own bedroom, and in the rear is a delightful little study where Emerson wrote nature. The book of tales I wrote there will always remind me of the river and the avenue, and especially the dear old Mr. Emerson is an everlasting rejecter of what is and a seeker for he knows not what. Yesterday afternoon, while my wife and Louisa Alcott and I were gathering the fallen apples in our orchard, Mr. Thoreau arrived with the boat. I entered for a lesson in rowing and paddling. Mr. Thoreau said that all I needed to do was to will the boat in any direction and she would immediately go do so. But the boat turned to every point on the compass but the right one. On emerging from the old manse, I returned to Salem and ascended the steps of the custom house. On the left was my office commanding a view of the dilapidated wharf. Many torpid months passed, and I began to calculate how much longer I could stay in the custom house and yet go forth a man. I read the last chapters of the Scarlet Letter to my wife last night. It broke her heart and sent her to bed with a grievous headache. Judging from its effect on her, I may calculate on what bowlers call a ten strike. Halfway down a by street of one of our New England towns stands a wooden house with seven gables and a huge clustered chimney in the midst.
Oh, you could not pass it without the idea that it had secrets to keep and an eventful history to moralize on. Upon my honor, I am not sure that I comprehend my own meaning in these blasted allegories, but I remember that I always had a meaning, or at least thought I had. I find it a charming irony that far more renowned than any of the large, lovely, long-lived houses we're seeing elsewhere in this program is a 10 by 15 foot wooden hut built by Henry Thoreau out near Walden Pond, which he lived in for only a couple of years before it was torn down and some farmer came along, carted away the boards to build a pigsty. No one even knew exactly where the cabin stood till the intrepid Roland Robbins dug up the foundation 100 years to the day from when Thoreau had finished building it. Now, no one could care where it was or even that it had existed at all until they read Thoreau's account of his life there in one of America's indispensable books called Walden or Life in the Woods. Walden is many books all in one. It's a stirring autobiography, a natural science wonder book, a treatise of mystical idealism, a joyous hymn to nature, and a manual of woods lore, and, well, not least, a scathing satire which makes us laugh, then cringe, then maybe think about the folly of some of our endeavors. It's Thoreau's own account of that errand into the wilderness from city to country, from old world to new, which all generations of Americans undertook until at least our own century. And in retrospect, it seems clear that Walden is uh, one of those books that the transcendentalist movement was born to create. Leaves of Grass by Whitman was the only other one. And once they had done so, the movement could fade quietly away. Thoreau was born in this farmhouse east of Concord and died 44 years later in the front parlor of this house on Main Street. The homes are two miles apart, and in a sense, that's about as far as Thoreau ever got in life. Oh, he went away to Harvard and hated it and took a few trips around the country, but Concord's woods and waters were as much of the world as he needed and its citizens as much of humanity as he could endure. He was a restless, edgy, 20-year-old, back-at-home, unemployed college graduate when Waldo Emerson, 14 years older and several inches taller, moved to Concord and turned out to be the first person in town whom Henry Thoreau could really talk to. Though eventually they grew wary of each other, for years the two of them rode the rivers and walked the hills, Waldo showing Henry the stars in the heavens and Henry showing Waldo the flowers and critters at his feet. On a few occasions, Thoreau lived in Emerson's house as gardener and handyman, and he was a toy maker and scoutmaster to the Emerson, Alcott, and Hawthorne children, and the ardent, though platonic, lover of Lydian Emerson, the second and last woman he ever loved. The first was Ellen Sewell, whose father refused to let her marry one of those radical followers of Emerson. Probably just as well, because Henry soon came to know that what he most wanted was a very unhusbandly life of simplicity, self-reliance, and spontaneity, and to have enough time to write about the rewards of such a life. His chance finally came when he was 27. In the spring of 1845, Emerson had bought 14 acres of land around Walden Pond, a couple of miles south of town, in order to save the trees from woodchoppers, a battle which rages to this very day. Though now Walden is all Boston's summer swimming hole, in the autumn, much as in Thoreau's day, its waters are disturbed only by fishermen, and the paths on the shore, first tramped out by Indians, still invite walkers and saunterers. Henry's friend Ellery Channing wrote him a letter ordering him, go out upon that pond, build yourself a hut. I see no other hope for you, eat yourself up. Thus inspired, Thoreau got Emerson's approval and in three months time, he had floored, walled and roofed his cabin a few dozen yards up from Walden's northern shore. Today, these stone posts mark the location of the cabin. Its door faced the lake a replica of the cabin shows us its size and design. It had a crawl space above, a tiny cellar below, two windows, and a woodshed out back. 
He furnished it with a cane bed, desk, and three chairs, built a fireplace, and moved in on the 4th of July, 1845. One immediate benefit was room to breathe and quiet to write, which he had never had in the home in town where he had lived with his parents, sisters, aunts, and a gaggle of maiden lady boarders who had eyes just for him. He wasn't a hermit out at Walden, though. He often strolled to town, and Concordians came to picnic near his hut, or even in it when it rained. His Aunt Maria said, why, going to see Henry is one of Concord's first recreations. A newcomer to town wrote that Concord seemed to have three religions only, the Orthodox, the Unitarian, and the Walden Pond Society. For all the company he got, Thoreau found plenty of time to become an intimate of the lake and the life teeming in and around it, and to finish one book and start another. One July day in his second summer at the lake, his friend, the Constable Sam Staples, put Henry in jail overnight for refusing to pay his six-dollar poll tax as a protest against slavery in the Mexican War. The jail was located on what is now this lawn next to the town square. Legend has it that Emerson went to see Thoreau in jail, but recoiled from what he considered the tastelessness of Henry's protest. Thoreau's essay about his night in jail, Civil Disobedience, has inspired Gandhi, Martin Luther King, and leaders of nonviolent independence movements everywhere. And so the clank of Sam Staples' key turning in Henry's cell door became the second shot from Concord to be heard round the world. During the last decade of his life, Thoreau published his two books to mixed reviews and a few sales. Walden, or Life in the Woods, the second book, came out in 1854. Henry's sister, Sophia, drew the picture for the title page. In the 150 years since then, Walden has sold millions of copies in dozens of languages. In the 1850s, he and his abolitionist family fought against slavery and established their home as a station on the Underground Railway. He gave a fiery speech defending John Brown the night Brown was hanged. And when one of Brown's men, a Francis Merriam, fled to Concord, crazed with fear of hanging, Thoreau knocked him out and threw him on a train to Canada. One December day in 1860, he went out in a snowstorm to count tree rings and caught a cold which soon became tuberculosis. For months he was tended at home. All his visitors described his courage and serenity, even folks who had despised him as a cantankerous layabout sent him flowers, letters, and gifts. Finally, on a May morning in 1862, Henry Thoreau, whom Sophia Hawthorne called Concord itself in one man, died on the bed he had slept on out at Walden Pond. My life as a boy was ecstasy. Before I lost any of my senses, I was all alive. The morning and the evening were sweet to me, and I led a life aloof from men. There is more of the divine revealed in Emerson than in any. I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, to front only the essential facts of life, and see if I could not learn what it had to teach, and not when I came to die, discover that I had not lived. It is only when we forget all our learning that we begin to know. If you would make acquaintance with the ferns, you must forget your botany. You must be aware that no thing is what you have taken it to be if you wish it to help redeem your life. Henry, what are you doing in here? Waldo, what are you doing out there? The prison is the only house in a slave state in which a free man can abide with honor. How I love my neighbors who mind their business and let me alone and who never shot at me when I cross their fields. It is surprising and memorable to be lost in the woods. Not till we are lost, have lost the world, do we begin to find ourselves. The greater part of what my neighbors call good, I believe bad. 
and if I repent of anything, it is likely to be my good behavior. Emerson would not come to see me, but was hurt if I did not visit him. He would not accept a favor, but would gladly confer one. We grieve that we do not love each other. Perhaps, on that spring morning when Adam and Eve were driven out of Eden, Walden Pond was already in existence and obtained a patent from heaven to be the only Walden Pond in the world and distiller of celestial dews. I left the woods for as good a reason as I went there. I learned this, at least, by my experiment, that if one advances confidently in the direction of his dreams, he will meet with a success unexpected in common hours. Thoreau is buried here in Concord's ancient cemetery called Sleepy Hollow. He lies here with his parents, his beloved brother John, and his sisters. And it's comforting in a way to know that even in death, as in life, he's not too far from his friends and neighbors. Across the path from me here is the grave of Nathaniel Hawthorne and his family. And in effect, just next door to them, off to my left, is the grave of the Alcotts, Bronson, and Louisa, Abigail, the whole clan are there. Somehow, it's fitting, I guess, that nearby, but just a little above them on a ridge, is the grave of Ralph Waldo Emerson. He lies in his family plot, surrounded by many of his family members and descendants. That great stone marks his grave. If I could, I'd like to return for a moment to Thoreau's final months. I find it wondrously coincidental that in the spring of 1862, one of his deathbed visitors was an old friend, the abolitionist pastor and writer Thomas Wentworth Higginson. When Higginson got home from saying farewell to Thoreau, he found waiting for him a letter written by a 31-year-old woman who lived in this house in Amherst, Massachusetts, which was 100 miles west of Concord. A complete stranger to Higginson, she had written him in response to an Atlantic Monthly article in which he had called for new writers to step forth. She had enclosed four poems and a calling card with the name Emily Dickinson penciled on it. Eight years and many letters later, Higginson finally paid a call on Miss Dickinson at her family's home. He was awaiting her in the parlor when suddenly, he said, in glided a plain, shy little person who came toward me with two daylilies saying, these are my introduction. Forgive me if I am frightened. I never see strangers and hardly know what to say. Hardly know what to say. Well, when her poems were finally published after her death, it became clear she knew exactly what to say, but she just couldn't find anyone who knew how to listen. Startled and bewildered by her intense brilliance, Higginson and the rest of the 19th century fled from her. And so she closed her door on them and, and wrote her poems for a world which only decades later would be ready for them. Even for modern readers, some of her poetry is too obscure, clumsy, some of it's too cute. But dozens of her poems are ranked among the most dazzling in the language. They explode like tiny grenades of wit and passion, faith and despair, joy and lamentation. I also don't think she was quite as disconnected from her world as we sometimes think. For one thing, she read every book she could find, especially those being cranked out by the boys in Concord. And she used her poems to get in on the conversation with them. Alas, only we and not they had a chance to hear her voice. But like the transcendentalists, she felt an ecstatic delight in the presence of nature. And both she and Henry Thoreau discovered in a single plot of ground an entire universe and found out how many lives you can live if you just live simply enough. Like Hawthorne, she portrayed the warmth, the grief, and the responsibility that comes from a life centered on kinfolk and neighbors. Emily also used her poems to express her angry rejection of the social and religious constrictions which dominated her father's house and all Amherst. 
And perhaps it's these heresies which led her to hide herself and her poems from her own world so that as we read them, she seems to be whispering them to us as if they were her deepest secrets and we her dearest and only friends. Outwardly, Dickinson's is the most uneventful life imaginable. She was born in this mansion built by her grandfather. She lived here most of her life with her father, mother, and sister Lavinia, or Vinnie. From the side windows of her room, Emily could see the path through the trees which connected her house with the one next door called the Evergreens, where her brother Austin and his wife Sue and their children lived. Beyond the Evergreens, Emily could see to the town commons and Amherst College, which were the special concerns of her prosperous, public-spirited grandfather, father, and brother. In the Dickinson homestead, Emily helped Vinnie with domestic chores and tended her parents, who died a few years before Emily herself. She grew Amherst's loveliest flowers, wrote hundreds of warm, witty letters to friends and kinfolk, and spent lots of time fulfilling what Vinnie said was Emily's special responsibility to do the family's thinking. In her 20s, Dickinson was in love with a law clerk of her father's, Ben Newton, who died young. In her 30s, she was in love with the Reverend Charles Wadsworth, who was married and lived far away. And in the last decade of her life, she was powerfully in love again with Judge Otis Lord of Salem, who wished to marry her and she him, though her solitary habits and then his death came in the way. But the main business of her life, as she knew from her 20s on, was her poetry, and nearly all else had to be sacrificed for it. Long before her death, the vivacious, teenaged Emily, whose teachers had said she would never receive God's grace and who had called herself the Belle of Amherst, had become the reclusive woman known as the Myth of Amherst. Dressed always in white, this is one of her dresses. She never traveled farther than her garden and saw nearly no one but family. She kept slips of paper in her apron and wrote her poems in the kitchen, up on the cupola on the roof, out in the garden, and here in her room on a tiny table between the front windows which looked out on Main Street and her father's meadows. In her early 30s, with the nation at war and her threatened by blindness and afflicted by a forlorn love for Wadsworth or someone else, Dickinson wrote one great poem after another, sometimes one a day. She organized some of them into packets of a dozen or so and tied them together with thread. She never submitted them for publication. Emily died in her bed at the age of 55 in the spring of 1886 after a long struggle with kidney disease. Shortly after the funeral, Vinnie made two discoveries in Emily's room, her letters, which she burned, and hidden in the dresser and other places in the room, almost 1,800 poems, Emily Dickinson's true life's work and her only secret which should matter to us. Stunned by the discovery and then determined to see the poems published, Lavinia turned to Austin's wife, Sue, who wouldn't help her, and then to Austin's mistress, Mabel Todd, who, with Higginson's assistance, brought out a first collection of poems four years after Dickinson's death. It took another 65 years for them all to reach print. But on the day of Emily's funeral, her poems were still hidden and unknown to the mourners in the homestead. Her body lay in a coffin in the hall, dressed in white, her hair still auburn. In her hands was a spray of violets, which Vinnie said were for Judge Lord. Irish servants carried her casket out the back door and across the fields to the cemetery. Austin Dickinson said that his sister's imagination had sparkled and she gave it free rein. She was full of courage. She saw things directly and just as they were, and she abhorred sham. Emily Dickinson's own last words were in a simple note to her cousins, the Norcross sisters, who lived in Concord, Massachusetts. In childhood, I never sowed a seed unless it was perennial. 
and that is why my garden lasts. My mother does not care for thought. Father buys me many books, but begs me not to read them because he fears they joggle the mind. They are religious except me and address an eclipse every morning they call their father. It's as if Mr. Emerson had come from where dreams are born. How do most people live without thoughts? How do they get strength to put on their clothes in the morning? Your bond to your brother reminds me of mine to my sister. Early, earnest, indissoluble. Without her life were fear and paradise a cowardice. The fire bells are oftener now, almost, than the church bells. Thoreau would wonder which did the most harm. I had a terror since September. I could tell to none. And so I sing as the boy does by the burying ground, because I am afraid. Hawthorne appalls entices. Father does not live with us now. He lives in a new house. Though it was built in an hour, it is better than this. He hasn't any gardens because he moved before gardens were made. So we take him the best flowers. And if we only knew he knew, perhaps we could stop crying. Father's heart was pure and terrible, and I think no other like it exists. Odd that I who say no so much cannot bear it from others. Odd that I who run from so many cannot brook that one turn from me. I cannot live with you. It would be life, and life is over there, behind the shelf the sexton keeps the key to. So we must meet apart, you there, I here, with just the door ajar, that oceans are, and prayer, and that white sustenance, despair. Life is a spell so exquisite that everything conspires to break it. Inebriate of air am I, and debauchee of dew, reeling through endless summer days from inns of molten blue. When landlords turn the drunken bee out of the foxglove's door, when butterflies renounce their drams, I shall but drink the more, till seraphs swing their snowy hats and saints to windows run to see the little tippler leaning against the sun. Emily is buried in Amherst West Cemetery. On one side is her sister Lavinia, on the other, her parents and her grandparents. The graves are overlooked by an evergreen and enclosed in an iron fence, though its gate is never shut. Emily outlived all the conquered writers, but she, like they, in kind of a wonderful coincidence, was buried on a beautiful spring day filled with blooms and blossoms. They've all been dead for more than a century now and would be forgotten forever if it weren't for all their passion, their wisdom, and their eloquence. It'll be their last words in this program as they join in a long overdue conversation. But first I want to read something that was written by a friend of Henry Thoreau's shortly after Henry's death, because I think the words apply just as much to Waldo Emerson, Nathaniel Hawthorne, and Emily Dickinson. He was such an effective witness of what is highest and most precious in life. As I reread his letters, I am still moved and instructed by them 
so that in a sense they are still in the mail, have not altogether reached me yet, and will not probably before I die. The Amherst heart is plain and whole and permanent and warm. My earliest friend wrote me the week before he died, if I live, I will go to Amherst. If I die, I certainly will. I detest the town of Salem so much that I hate to go into the streets or to have the people see me. Anywhere else, I shall at once be entirely another man. I was born into the most estimable place in all the world, and in the very nick of time, too. Here are all the friends I ever had or shall have. Here is all that you love, all that you expect, all that you are. What more do you want? I believe in neighborhoods and that the kingdom of heaven consists in such. I myself live in an agreeable neighborhood in a town which I have many reasons to love. Sophia and I have been living in eternity since we came to the old manse, our paradise. Home is the definition of God. My new house cannot be fine until trees and flowers give it a life of its own. We shall crowd so many books and wise friends into it that it shall have so much wit as it can carry. I began to occupy my house on the 4th of July. I had three chairs in my house, one for solitude, two for friendship, and three for society. I kept neither dog, cat, cow, pig, nor hens to cackle in the yard. No yard, and no path to the civilized world. During the long rainstorms, I sat behind my door in my little house and thoroughly enjoyed its protection. Now back in Concord, I spend delectable hours on the hill behind my house, stretched out at my lazy length with a book in my hand or an unwritten book in my thoughts. Eden is that old-fashioned house we dwell in every day without suspecting our abode until we drive away. I reached the other day the end of my 57th year and I am easier in my mind than hitherto. Now, when my wife says, perhaps this tumor on your shoulder is a cancer, I say, what if it is? My cold turned to bronchitis, and my doctor told me that I must clear out to the West Indies or elsewhere. So I selected Minnesota. I am encouraged to know that, so far as you are concerned, I have not written my books in vain. I suppose that I have not many months to live, but I am enjoying existence as much as ever, and regret nothing. Dear Frank, my health continues rather poor, but I shall hope to revive rapidly once we are on the road. Henry, have you made your peace with God? I did not know that we had ever quarreled. Where are we? Which house? And who's the sleeper? That gentleman was a sweet, beautiful soul, but I have entirely forgot his name. Little cousins, call back. Emily. Henceforth, I am a citizen of somewhere else. I died for beauty, but was scarce adjusted in the tomb. When one who died for truth was laying in an adjoining room. He questioned softly why I failed. For beauty, I replied. And I for truth. The two are one. We brethren are. He said. And so, as kinsmen met a night, we talked between the rooms. Until the moss had reached our lips and covered up our names.